unglued? It does. It comes unglued. If you have a change in pH, if you have high temperature, you know what high temperature is going to do? It's going to start breaking those bonds. If that happens, we call that denaturation. Denaturation is when the protein unravels and loses its native shape due to change in pH, change in salt concentration, or the temperature. A denatured protein is biologically inactive. That shouldn't surprise you because remember what I said? A protein structure determines its function. If you mess up the structure, the function is not going to work. Number 12 says excessive high fevers can be fatal. You know why? Because proteins in the blood can denature at a very high temperature. So that's why if you're, they worry if you're, um, one reason why they worry if you start having a high temperature. This is showing you the normal protein and when it's denatured, it just like comes unglued in the test tube. Sometimes they can get it to go back together but in the body, just pretty much all the time, once it's unglued, it's unglued. Now, on your sheet, if you will look at 12 A, B, C, D and just mark that out, that's not supposed to be, it's just a repetition of what we just said. Just mark that out. Okay, so now we'll go, we've talked about carbohydrates, we've talked about lipids, we've talked about um, proteins, the last thing we'll talk about are nucleic acids. Are nucleic acids considered macromolecules? Yes, sir. We have two types of nucleic acids, DNA and RNA. If I were to give you this, you can write this on the board and you tell me. Okay, I wonder if I said, which is a macromolecule and your choices are Which one of those would be considered a macromolecule? Well, are monosaccharides macromolecules? Macro means really big. What's monosaccharide? It's one subunit. So I would say no. Do you agree? What about phospholipids? No. Because lipids aren't big enough to be considered. What about DNA? DNA, yes. Because DNA, what is DNA? DNA is a nucleic acid. Is nucleic acid, if I said, is, a, is, is nucleic acid a macromolecule, what would you tell me? Yep. DNA is a nucleic acid. So DNA is a macromolecule. Does that make sense? Now, it's made up of subunits. If we were to break it down and say, is one of those subunits considered? It's not. But a DNA molecule in itself is large enough to be considered because it's considered nuclear, also RNA. Genes are made up of DNA, which is a nucleic acid. There are two types, deoxyribonucleic acid and ribonucleic acid. Two important things that DNA does. Number one, DNA provides directions for its own replication. You know that your cells are constantly, let's say you, sometimes they just, they're old and they need to be, you know, um, you have, need to have new ones. Um, but if you scrape your skin, you need new cells made there too, right, for repair. So when it copies itself and it's going to make a new cell, it's got to copy its DNA or the new daughter cell is not going to have DNA in it. Makes sense, doesn't it? So the two important things that DNA does, remember it's got, it's like the brains, it's got the directions. DNA codes for its own replication. That's important. 
because we need DNA in the cells, the new daughter cells. Codes for its own replication, but that's not all. DNA also codes for messenger RNA, and messenger RNA is going to then code for amino acids, which will end up coding for proteins. So the DNA, from the DNA, you get messenger RNA. DNA will code for your messenger RNA, and it's actually your messenger RNA that's going to be red. You know what I'm saying? That's when it says, okay, what are the you have A, C, G, A, whatever, G, G. That's messenger RNA. And then what happens is you're on your ribosome, your transfer RNA comes along and reads it, and it says, okay, that codes for this amino acid. This codes for another amino acid. So you hook the amino acids together, get polypeptides, they go together to form a protein. Protein synthesis, as we said, occurs on the ribosomes. It's very important that you know the top of the next page where it says DNA to RNA to protein. That's considered what we call the central dogma of biology. I mean, this is like really, really important. That sequence, that DNA codes for messenger RNA, it codes for proteins. So ultimately, DNA is the, that's the instruction manual. It's kind of controlling everything in the cell, and you need to know the sequence. That would be very important that you would want to know. And we call that the central dogma. This is showing you here what happens. You have the synthesis of messenger RNA, and here's DNA, it's double-stranded. See, double helix here. RNA is single-stranded. So this tells what, how the bases are going to be for messenger RNA, the bases are the letters that I have. It goes out of the nucleus. Of course, are we talking about this picture? Would you say this is a eukaryotic cell or a prokaryotic cell? It's a eukaryotic cell, and you know how you know? How do you know that? Because it's got a nucleus, very good. Um, it, it still goes to the same DNA, RNA, protein in a prokaryotic cell, but there's no nucleus. It just all happens in a cytoplasm. It moves out. Now we have messenger RNA, and this messenger RNA is, I'm going to say, it's fed through the ribosome. Here's your amino acids. Whatever it says, okay, I need, I have read these three letters. That three letter stands for this amino acid. So they pick it up, add it to the growing polypeptide chain, which is has peptide bonds within each of the amino acids, which will then go together with other polypeptides to form a functional protein. Okay, um, the next thing is polynucleotides, which means many nucleotides, are polymers consisting of monomers, each called a nucleotide. So nucle nucle nucleic acids, Monomers would be polynucleotides or nucleotides. The monomers would actually be nucleotides. Each nucleotide has a nitrogenous base, a pentose sugar, and a phosphate group. The nitrogenous base are those letters that I always write on the board. Let me show you a picture of it. Okay, this is how it looks. Okay, this is a polynucleotide, they're breaking it down here to just a nucleotide, you have a phosphate group, you've got your nitrogenous base, which is right here, and it's hooked to a sugar. I'm looking at on your sheet on B, let's talk about the sugar. The sugar in DNA and RNA are both a five carbon sugar, which means we call it a pentose. The ribose sugar is in RNA, and deoxyribose is in DNA. So this is your monomer, this unit right here, and they hook together by dehydration, of course, to form the long polynucleotide, which will make up your nucleic acid. 
Now, your bases, you have um, two different types, either pyrimidines or purines, but you don't have to know that for this chapter. You just need to know that it has nitrogenous bases. And the bases are, we call them, for cytosine, we just always put C, for thymine, we put T, uracil, U, adenine, A, and guanine, C. You notice that these are bigger than the pyrimidines. So just common sense tells you if the DNA is going to be like a, a ladder, that it's going to be the same shape. So do you think that you would have two pyrimidines ever pairing together or two purines? No, you would not. What would you have? What do you always have? Well, if the shape's got to be the same, you're going to have to have a pyrimidine with a purine. Because if you had two of these, if A and G ever went together, then Something that's right. going to, it's going to stick out, isn't it? So to keep the shape the same, you've got to have a big pairing with a little. And then it could be a little big, but you can't have two bigs or two littles or the shape is not going to be the same. So what you need to know is, you don't need to know which is which, but you do need to know what pairs with what. That's, I think there's a question in the chapter that talks about that. A always pairs with T, and G always pairs with C. Now this is in DNA. In RNA, we don't have T. In RNA, we have actually uracil instead. So this would be uracil in RNA. So uracil would pair with adenine. Guanine and cysteine always go together. So we say that the strands are complementary, which means if you know one strand of the DNA nucleotide base, then you will know what the next one is. For example, if you've got this sequence, oh, let me show you this. One of my students in my interactive class said, an easy way to remember what goes together, these are kind of like curved letters, and these are straight. They're made by straight, which is pretty cool, isn't it? This, you can't make this by straight lines, okay. So if we're talking about DNA, and I tell you that this is what it is, this is one, and I will tell you that they're directional, which means this one would be five prime, this end, they're different ends. This complementary base is going to be anti-parallel. So if this is five, this one will be three. If this is three, that's going to be five. I want you to tell me what the letters. Did you figure out the letters on that second strand? I'll wait just a minute if you want, everybody wants to try to do that. Well, you have to say, what pairs with G? Right. What pairs with T? A. What pairs with A? G. What pairs with C? G. Now what you need to remember if you're doing a problem like this, if they say what is a complementary strand, check the direction of the strands because DNA is anti-parallel, which means it runs in opposite directions. This is going in the five prime to three prime, this is three prime to five prime. You would never have both five primes at the same end. You'd never have both three primes at the same end. Um, let's see, is there anything else I need to tell you about that? Okay, about the sugars, I told you that deoxyribosysteine in DNA. What is the difference in ribose and deoxyribose sugar? They're similar, very similar. They're both five carbons. See which we have a carbon at each one of these little intersections. One, two, three, four, five. But what's the difference in it? It lacks an oxygen. It lacks an oxygen, exactly. That's why we call it D, D, E means without. OXY without an oxygen. And it's right here on the two prime. Do you see this one just has a hydrogen? This one has a hydroxyl group. So deoxyribonucleic acid has one less oxygen. And that's an important thing that you might want to remember. Yes. Deoxyribonucleic acid DNA has one less oxygen molecule than the sugar in RNA. Okay, I've told you about the three prime and the five prime. These links 
create a backbone of sugar phosphate units with a nitrogenous basis as appendages. If you think about it as a double helix, which it is, let me see if I can get it. We said that it's anti-parallel, and I told you how they pair. If you look at this DNA molecule, here's the five prime den, this is the three prime den of the other complementary strand. This right here, it's like when you think of the ladder, the sides of the ladder, what they're made up of is the sugar phosphate groups. Now the nucleotides that I told you, like the C and the G, the different bases like that, they're the ones that are sticking out that are going to be joined to make the rung of the ladder. That's how I think about it. Now what does this little dot, dot, dot mean between C and G? Hydrogen bond. Right. It can be a break, but it's hydrogen bonded. And we said that that's very important. Hydrogen bonds hold together the bases. Now, why is it wonderful that it's hydrogen bonds? Wouldn't it be better if we had covalent bonds? Aren't they stronger? Uh, they, they are stronger. Right. right. In this case, we need them to break apart because synthesis of DNA cannot occur or messenger RNA can be. The first step is it's going to be break. These bonds will break. You see it here happening. This is actually showing you how that you're making a new strand of DNA. What happens is it breaks apart. The hydrogen bonds break. And when they do, this is going to pick up a C, this is going to pick up a G, this is going to pick up an A. You've already seen here, it's already matched all these. We'll end up with two, at the end we'll end up with um, two strands of new molecules of DNA. Okay, on your sheet, if you look um, on the last sheet, it, oh, I forgot to tell you, who came up with the whole DNA stuff? It's really, the really important people in biology, it's Watson and Crick. I don't ask you to know many people but Watson and Crick. Now, there is some debate that, of course, they didn't do all this work themselves, but they're the ones that get the credit. You know, there's some other people, Rosalind Franklin, there were some other people that did a bunch of steps that made them be able to discover this. And it's even a question, were they the ones, but they were the ones that got the Nobel Prize for the structure of DNA. That was in 1954, and, and no, I didn't go to school with them, and I wasn't born then, but um, they're really famous. They said that the DNA structure is a two sugar phosphate backbone that runs in opposite direction of each other. We talked about with chapter one, if I know how much of one base there is, could I figure out the percentage of another base in an in a organism's DNA? Because we don't have the same percentage, we have the same four bases in DNA as an insect, but we don't have the same percentage of the various bases. So we did something like this, I believe with chapter one, just to remind you, if I told you that I knew that something had 10% thymine in its DNA, and I wanna know how much guanine we have, can you do that problem? Because you would say, well, I know if it's 10% thymine, how much adenine am I gonna have? Those members don't have thought of T, I've got an A. So I'm going to have 10%. So now I've got, I've counted for 20% of my total DNA. How many, how much DNA percent wise is there in, in any organism? 100%. 100%. So now what we do is we say 100 minus 20. So now I've got 80% not accounted for, but I've got two bases not accounted for, right? Where are the two bases left? G and C. Right? So that tells me that the number of G plus C is going to be 80%. So if I want to say how much G, what's the percentage of 40. G, then it would be 40. Y'all are too smart. That's, just want to make sure you know how to do that. If you look on the last sheet, I just reminded you that a DNA molecule is anti-parallel. It's like a divided highway. There's the same distance between the strands, but they're running in opposite directions. The sugar phosphate backbone is outside the double helix. The nitrogen bases, nitrogenous bases, which is A, T, G, C, whatever. They're on the inside. And they're joined by hydrogen bonds. And then I gave you a little problem to do there. If I gave you that five prom strand, could you fill out the three prom for me? Y'all see what I'm talking about? I gave you a little practice to where it says A, C, C, T. I think in your book they give you a problem like this. 
And one of the choices that they put is There are predictable counterparts of each other. At the end of your chapter, here's a good um, a little review of the different structures of everything. I don't know if you all look at these, but I think it's great. Which kind of like gives it in a little form of everything that we went over. This is just showing you um, for an amino acid, how you have the amino group and you have that carboxyl group, you split that out and what kind of bond is going to be formed if you do that. We have amino acid, amino acid, what kind of bond? It's a dehydration reaction, what kind of bond? Yes. Peptide? Good, okay. That's just showing you, if I were to give you one string, could you tell me if it's mismatched or not, or which band is wrong? They ask you to make a little chart with the different um, molecules, what the monomers are, what the polymer would be, and the type of linkage. Okay, which shouldn't be a problem for you to do, but that's on your slide if you need it. Now, um, you have a test on Wednesday. I, you